Nieko Pravne Radio PL. Uh, I'm from Poland, as many of you might sense it from my uh, English and from my accent. And that's what I'd like to say, that uh, we already been doing already a few times uh, this kind of uh, events to Polish community mostly so far. But we had an idea as well to start um, doing that for <coughs> Irish community too. Why? Because we see that in the present days there is a many things, things, many topics, which actually we both nations have a lot of in common, as I can say. Uh, today we're gonna actually uh, take a part in the speech panel later on in the discussion. And our dear guest, Kathy Sinot, very well known by the local community. And <laughs> Grzegorz Brown, who is uh, the author of the movie, movie we just about to see. Uh, one more thing what I'd like to say, I won't take any more, any more uh, of your time, um, that we're also working together with the One World Chronicle. Peter is right over there. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'd like to say. Uh, all these problems we're actually facing right now in Poland, sooner or later, you're going to face it yourself here in Ireland. And it's actually the other way around as well. Mm -hmm. Whatever is happening right now in Ireland, mm -hmm. we will get it in Poland. Mm -hmm. And if we'll do things together, there is a huge chance actually to stop. Okay? Because we really do want to live in a world where there is a safe family and safe environment for our kid children. Okay? Thank you very much. And uh, I wish... Pleasant viewing. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Brown, Grzegorz Brown. Grzegorz is Gregory in, uh, in Poland. Uh, Grzegorz. Uh, and this is my documentary film, Eugenics in the Name of Progress. Uh, it will be uh, with English subtitles. So, uh, some of you might uh, probably want to uh, get closer to the screen, <laughs> for the screen, screening, uh, but there will be uh, some English, American English speakers in this documentary, so not everything will uh, have to be read <laughs> from the screen. Uh, the film lasts uh, um, 50 50 minutes or so, uh, and uh, uh, let's start, let's start. formed a conclusion, who they didn't want, and then they formed the science on why they should not want them. So poor people were a disease, a bacterium, untermatch. Do you understand? So we're just about to see a very, very, I hope, interesting movie, some documentary with a lot of facts we haven't been aware of before. So uh, that's what I'd like to assume. As a modern family living in the present days, we attack from different sides. From the beginning, where we start all from the same position, which is birth as a babies, abortion. Another thing which is actually very, very uh, dangerous, uh, that would be euthanasia. We all aging. So that actually is still about us. And that's what is actually also uh, offered assisted suicide. Any time in your life, if you choose, there will be that uh, thing as well available for you. So we'll start maybe from Kathy. Kathy, please, can you comment on it? Yeah, great. Um, I suppose I, it was just a wonderful documentary. So congratulations for a start. I, I just think really, really, really good. Um, I, I suppose one of the comments that I, I had from the very beginning is this came from somewhere. And, you know, no matter how far back 
we we go we'll find somewhere else it came from and somewhere else but there is a point that i think is important to um i think there's a particular point in history that we can see a very direct connection of the birth of eugenics and that's the enlightenment and um actually gabriel you might say something about this as well but the enlightenment was a philosophical uh movement if you like uh, Voltaire would be one of the famous um, Enlightenment uh, people. Uh, the thinking of the Enlightenment was very important in the French Revolution uh, and, and vice versa. Um, but the idea was that people came to sort of see themselves as an elite, as enlightened. You know, we think of the Enlightenment as the beginning of social justice and all the rest, but it wasn't. The Enlightenment was really about the fact that certain people were superior and that if the world was going to, you know, <coughs> carry on in an orderly fashion, and orderly means that profit and colonization and shipbuilding and all the things that make money and keep people in the, the lifestyles they were had become accustomed to, um, you needed that elite, that enlightened, that superior group of people to lead. And that people were no longer being seen as, you know, sort of the, the Christian concept, that every person has an innate dignity, that it doesn't matter if they have a severe disability like my son, or if they have, if they're elderly, or if they're babies, or if they're black, or if they're white, that every single person has a dignity and a destiny, which was heaven. Every person had a dignity and destiny, and that everything else was an accident of nature, if you like. Everybody had a role to play, uh, some of them in their dependency, some of them in their ability, etc. And, and this kind of went by the board. And the idea was that you had dignity in as far as you were useful. And I think one of the key points of that, that really came in in the Enlightenment was usefulness. So therefore you had the enlightened, you had the superior people, and then you needed a, a very broad base of ignorant people, and I'm using enlightenment-type terms. They believed in keeping people poor and ignorant because back in that day, you needed people to, you know, man the plows. You needed, you know, the sailors to, you know, sail the boats. You needed people to work the early factories. You needed human brawn and, and all this, but you didn't want them to have brains. You, you wanted them just to do the work. And then you needed a class of people that would fulfill all the specialized functions. Like the wealthy, they needed people who served the table properly and spoke softly and knew how to iron their clothes just right. They needed accountants you know, book ledger, you know, people keeping their ledgers just right. They needed ship captains. Now, none of these were the elite, but they were functionaries, and Voltaire was very specific. He, and he had shares in slaves himself and in plantations in the New World. But Voltaire, and if you look at popular histories of Voltaire, he's seen as the person that, you know, brought us to modern progress. But his idea was that in order to have the, the functionaries in between the elite and the, the ones you just walked on, you just used them to keep the coal into the, you know, into the big furnaces and things, um, and, and go down in the mines and dig the coal, you, these functionaries, that in order to ha be safe, in order for the elite to be safe and have functionaries near them, you needed to be sure that they were raised without love. So his recommendation was that you take children from their families and you have them raised by people who don't love them, right? Talented children, beautiful children, you know, children you wanted to have around you, but children who would be so emotionally deprived that they would be loyal to you, that you would become their loyalty. You would be able to manipulate them. You would, so you would be able to safe, be safe to have a 
a basement full of these well-trained servants and you never be worried about them, you know, rebelling or something like that. So the Enlightenment began to reclassify people by their function, by ability and by function. But then what happened when this, this philosophy, because it went through many permutations, so what happened then when we didn't need factories anymore? Now, in modern day, because the Enlightenment is still very much here, that thinking is still here about usefulness. And so what happens then when we don't need all this, you know, these thousands and thousands of people to, you know, machines can go down in the mines and, you know, we don't, you know, shovel coal into big steam furnaces anymore. You know, machines do all that, nuclear power and all the rest. So what do we... Well... The answer, obviously, is that you contracept, you abort them, you, you, know, you make sure that there aren't a lot of these people. But you still need the functionary class, and so you want to control education, you want to control the way they think and the way they're, the way they're raised. I remember for me, a, a, a really a point <coughs> that was one of those aha moments for me, and I know I've told some of you about this, I was in the European Parliament, and we were, we were discussing the Barcelona Agreement the fact that one-third of children before the age of three must be raised in childcare. Every country is signed up to this, every EU country. And by three years of age, 90% must be raised in childcare, right? And they were criticizing again, because please? must be raised in some form of childcare by the third birthday, 90%. By twenty, by twenty ten, yes. By twenty ten. By twenty ten. Sorry, we signed up to this in two thousand and one, in Barcelona, and you know when we had had debates on it before, because every few years it would come up and they would have a big review of it and how our country's doing, are we meeting our targets? And Ireland would always be criticised, and you notice the free three year old childcare place started what day, January first, two thousand and ten, because it was actually to technically meet our Barcelona um, commitment to have 90% of children in some form of child care by three. Now, in most countries, that means they're actually being raised in child care. We got away on the technicality of they've got something free. It's been offered to 100% of children. But anyway, everybody got up and gave the usual ta- you know, speeches, impassioned speeches about women being able to work and how we have to have child care. Blah, blah, blah. But then the socialist spokesperson got up. And now, the way speeches go, the first speaker that gets up is giving the party line, right? Second biggest grouping in the parliament. They're giving the party line, and this was their first speaker. So this was not a personal opinion. And she got up, and and just for your information, Labour, our socialist over in the parliament, uh, she got up and she said, look, it's wonderful if women can work, but this isn't what it's about. It's because it's a better way to raise children. Parents are not to be trusted. They are unreliable. And if we are going to have the citizens, that is, again, the enlightenment, the functionaries, you know, the specialized people, then we need to take over their, you know, their child care. We need to mold them. And so this comes in, you know, in some forms, and this is where eugenics comes you know, you have the situation of you want people to be useful, and if they're not useful, what what were they called? Hitler had a term. Oh, actually, Margaret Sanger had a term. Well, Margaret Sanger's one was useless eaters. Yes. Useless eaters, the people that were taking food that they there was no kickback for society to. And, you know, we think this is far away from us. I remember being on the phone years ago, um... And, you know, fighting the fight for education for people who are severely and profoundly disabled. And what did the, the official, quite a high official in the Department of Education, say to me? He said, there's no point in <coughs> educating the severe and profound. They just die. Mm-hmm. They just die. Mm-hmm. That was it. They just die. They're of no use. And they just die. Well, if some, some of you might have seen my son at the Mercy thing. This was the first year he so well he was able to go. 35 years old, but he told me back when he was, he was probably 13 or 40 at the time, no point in doing anything with him, he just, you know, they just, they just die. So, um, so we have many, many forms of eugenics, but it's deeply rooted in utilitarianism. 
the minute we stop understanding that the human person, regardless of ability, looks, race, anything, has an innate dignity and, and destiny, <coughs> then all that's left is another criteria. And so you're going to pick intelligence, you're going to pick beauty, you're going to pick something else if you don't have the fact of God-given humanity. And the Chinese right now are doing something very interesting, and you mentioned genetics, and you know, obviously genetics can have some very good purposes, etc. But America had the biggest genetic research facilities, and the most funding put in on genetics did have. Now China has <coughs> superseded America by multiples, and they have announced only this year, and this year isn't very old yet, and they've announced that they are very, very close to having come to an understanding of the genetics of intelligence. And the plan is, and this is in, it actually was sent to me from, um, well, from Brussels, uh, this article. The plan is that once they have cracked the codes and they've taken samples from hundreds of interestingly enough, Asian and Western smart people <laughs> that they consider smart and successful. Many of these people have been very flattered to be picked and have willingly <laughs> given their DNA samples, etc. You know, very, you know. And they haven't gone to Latin America and they haven't gone to Africa looking for any samples. <laughs> but anyway, and the idea is that you already need a license in China to have a baby. So once they have cracked these codes, the idea is that uh, they will designate many of these licenses only by IVF. And the idea is that then the babies are conceived, they look for certain genetic markers for intelligence, and then these will be the babies allowed to go. Because eugenics in Hitler's time you know, as you see, it, it happened in, in stoves and things like that. Now it happens in petri dishes. Yes. It happens in little petri dishes. And it also happens uh, in schools because not all eugenics means the death of somebody. It might mean the relegation of this one to that and that one to that and that one to that, which was why, you know, people are getting very worried in the U.S., because apparently there's something in Obamacare that they've just realized, it's just beginning, um, where children in public school will have data collected on them, all kinds of data collected on them. And the idea being very much that they will be able to, like the, like the Chinese Olympic you know, campaign, where you'll be able to identify children very young as athletic or bright or mathematical or musical and put your resources. Again, it's all about money, it's all about usefulness, it's all about making sure that your resources are put where they're going to be most effective. And um, I, I have a, a little uh, prediction to make myself, and i pass it on then because I'm talking way too long. But it's interesting because one area I know an awful lot about is autism. And autism is a huge problem for eugenicists, and let's call them that, because they they may change their name. You know, I was looking a lot at transhumanism lately, you know, doo-hoo. but anyway, they all changed their name, but they have a problem with aut- autism, right? Now, nine out of ten Down syndrome babies conceived in the UK never make it to birth. The U.S., it's again 90% of Down syndrome. I had a Down syndrome sister, I have a Down syndrome nephew, the most delightful people. You know, I mean, really just wonderful. A world without Down syndrome is a world with a really severe gap. But, um, But one of the things is that they can't get autism because it doesn't happen till after children are born. Yeah. Like my, my son wasn't, he was perfectly normal till his first vaccine at four months. So what do you do? What are you going to do about these ones that don't happen till 18 months or whatever? And interestingly enough, amazing vast sums of money have been spent on autism research. Vast sums. <coughs> All in genetics. Hmm. 
any of the research being done in gut disorders, you know, you've all heard of Dr. Wakefield, yes. you know, people like that. Any of this research being done is being done with the crumbs from the, the research <laughs> table. It's being done with parents fundraising. It's being done with, you know, private donations. All the big money is going genetics. And that makes all of us parents very, very nervous. Why? because it's not a genetic disease. And will I show you how I can prove it's not a genetic disease? Because in 1990, there was one child with autism for every 10,000 children. Today, the CDC has just come out with the figures, one child with autism for every 50 children. Hmm. That's in a generation. Hmm. And you can't have those kind of increases genetically. Genetics change yeah. over hundreds of years, very slowly. You know, every change takes a generation. Every little modification takes a generation. <laughs> so you can't go from 1 in 10,000, sorry, sorry, 4 in 10,000, 1 in 2,500 to 1 in 50 children. In Malta, it's 1 in 45, and they know every child in Malta, so they know the figures right. You can't make that ge jump genetically, so it's something else. <laughs> It's many other things. Mm -hmm. But all the money is going into genetics. Why? Why? Very interesting. And what is the plan for them? And, I, and sorry, I really promised to stop, so I'll say one more thing. I know what the plan is, because I was there when the planners were planning. Mm -hmm. In 2008 or, 2007 or 2008, the Aldi group in the parliament Aldi is where Fianna Fáil now sits. They didn't then, but they, sat, they sit now. It, they're the Liberals. And they had what was called uh, a hearing. It's a conference. And it was cost mega money. They used Parliament money to bring in speakers. But what they did is they used Parliament money to gather all the euthanasia groups in all of the European countries that were part of the EU and well beyond the EU, plus American speakers, etc. And they brought them all over for a hearing hmm. on mercy killing, right? Mercy killing. They always call it mercy killing. And today's Mercy Sunday. Uh, so it's, it's a very ironic use of the word. And in the morning, before the MEPs had the committee meeting started in the afternoon, in the morning, they had a whole morning of hard cases whole morning of all the hard cases from all over Europe and the U.S. Even Terry Schiavo got a mention, but no mm -hmm. mention of what actually happened. And in the afternoon, and there were so many MEPs, I've never seen so many MEPs at anything. There were so many MEPs there, but in the afternoon they all went to committee meetings. So the afternoon is when the real work happened. And so at Parliament expense, what effectively happened is that all the committees from all the euthanasia groups all over Europe and, as I say, the U.S., etc., all had a freebie to spend the whole day planning. They had brought their lawyers, they had brought their, you know, strategists, they brought... And they, the talks were all, number one, we have to know each other. We have to, everybody needs to pass around, you know, all this, you know, and their lists were passed around and all the rest. They had the talks all about demography. The fact that Europe by 2050, if we don't do something, eugenics, right, useless eaters, by 2050 will be one-third pension age. One-third pension age. Now, that's an economic impossibility for, you know, when you've had such a low birth rate. And now I hate when they talk about demographers talk about fertility rate. It's nothing to do with <laughs> fertility. The children are being conceived, they're just not getting to birth, so it's birth rate. So when you have a really low birth rate, you have very few young workers to support yeah. one-third of Europe. Yeah. In most societies, four workers are required to take care of one pensioner. Yeah. We will have two pensioners to one worker, right, by 2050 in Europe. They also talked about the increase in disability, and you know, this is where I really listen up, because the increase in disability is in autoimmunity, which is autism, uh, autoimmune diabetes, uh, epilepsy, all these autoimmune conditions, multiple sclerosis, etc. 
um, because they're nothing to do with genetics. They're nothing to do with birth. They're to do with what we do afterwards. Um, so anyway, they were like, we can't support this. The demography is not going to work. So then they spent the whole about the right to die and control and choice and medical rationing. If anyone had been following the Liverpool Care Plan, you know, the hundreds of thousands of British elderly disabled people and babies have been put on the Liverpool Care Plan as a, as a form of legal euthanasia, which is only now being investigated in the last few weeks, really. Um, but the, by the end of the day, they were not only saying we have this demography is going to have to have a solution, in other words, euthanasia, <coughs> but they also said that even children have a right to decide when they die without mm -hmm. parental interference, mm -hmm. right? Just between the child and their doctor, <laughs> you know. I mean, I've never had any of my children around a doctor without me present, you know. But so that the plan is already there. It is eugenics. It is. Absolutely, it because is. it's about useless eaters. It's about people fulfilling their function and then eliminating, being eliminated, etc. This is what the plan is, and it's very important, a documentary like that, because one thing we all agree with is that Hitler was a baddie, right? <laughs> and if we can take people who see Hitler as a baddie and begin to get them to understand that we're absolutely thinking the same thoughts in our culture, we're planning the same things in a much cleaner, more hygienic, more hospital sort of environment. But it's no different. And if we don't do that, um, well, that conference will have been very prophetic. Father? Oh, um, well, I don't have a lot to say. Just fair play. Is, I mean, we need more people. Genquia <coughs> Barzo. We need more people uh, in Ireland that have um, that uh, professionalism in video making because it, you know um, that is something that uh, struck me. Um, just what Cathy mentioned, just two points I'd make really. One is on the whole philosophy of utilitarianism, which is really um, the dominant, or one of the most dominant philosophies, that and moral relativism. Um, I'm the, I was just read, trying to read the Polish, but I believe that the one that was um, for um, uh, embryo research and that was... Yeah. Uh, yeah, he was talking about philosophy, and he said he'd leave it up to the philosophers. Yeah. So um, he's the guy who actually was the first to conduct the so-called in vitro procedure in Poland. So he's the the, the father, father. Uh, of this craft, yeah. witch craft <laughs> yeah. uh, in Poland. And there was one uh, mistake in well, uh, one uh, imperfection in this uh, translation because uh, uh, there is a well funny and uh, horrible ending um, in his uh, speech. That is, he says, "I avoid uh, such uh, conversation, philosophical mm -hmm. conversation." And in Polish, uh, he says, "Jak diabeł święconej wody," which uh, should be translated uh, into "As a devil avoids uh, sacred water." Uh, oh. <laughs> that's what he says. That's what he says. Yeah. 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 Well, I suppose that that's, yeah, I mean, all these, like, uh, Hitler was based on Nietzsche, um, communism, Marx, and then we have this utilitarianism. I see Peter uh, Singer, was it? Yeah. There? I think yeah. He'd be one of the major utilitarians. But I mean, if we look at that philosophy in itself, I mean, it's basically saying um, happiness for the majority. So what's the majority? 51%, so 49 can be yeah. experimented on. But even looking at, I mean, I suppose where God, um, in his wisdom, um, has, in his active will, has, um, for want of a better way of putting it, interfered here, is that when embryo research, with all the funding and all the money that's gone into embryo research um, for the minority, the embryos, to bring happiness to the majority by coming up with these um, cures... Um, all the money is going to not one cure, not one cure, mm -hmm. not one cure from from embryo research, but from adult stem cell research, from ethical stem yeah. cell research, seventy three cures have been found. Yeah. So there's, um, I mean, God in His active will, um, you know, saying, okay, well, we're not going to allow this pursuit because I mean, it's barbaric. 
what's mm. going on with the experiment on embryos and um, to pursue um, obviously cures and I think in general now I think what my understanding is that funding is being removed from a lot of these um, agencies or whatever you want to call them um, who are pursuing embryo research because they're not um, being successful essentially. Yeah but that's interesting because the the private funding because private companies um, and by private I don't mean corporate I don't mean like Rockefeller or anything mm-hmm. yeah. but um, businesses uh, a, a guy who uh, ran a venture capital uh, sponsored drug company was telling me oh sure they're all getting out of that they're all getting out of the embryo research you know it was you know, genetic therapy was the big thing in the 90s and the embryo was the big thing in 2000, but they all have realized they're losing money. And that's why they try to do it in law. Because then governments mm. pay for it, taxpayers mm. pay for it, so it doesn't mm-hmm. matter if it's successful. Mm-hmm. So that's why the big yeah. fight we had with the uh, seventh framework and the different framework, the big funding pots in Europe, uh, that's why they fought so hard to keep in the right for Europe to give money to embryo research and uh, animal, human, hybrid, and chimeric, yeah, yeah, yeah. which nobody really looked at, but in <laughs> fact was, you know, flashing red light as well. Um, because companies, people who actually try and make money, don't want to mm. spend on it anymore because it's it's useless. But people want governments to spend on it because... It's not about cures. It is about transhumanism and things like that. It's about having permission to do anything they want so they can take it anywhere they want. And it is about breeding children, breeding people uh, whose only parent would be the government. (laughs) If the government is is the sponsor of the in vitro procedure uh, that uh, every company demands, every company that, uh, that uh, offers this, this uh, kind of procedure, at least in Poland. This is what the fight is over, uh, far from over. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, they all want to turn it into, into uh, uh, part of uh, our legal system so that the government would sponsor uh, this particular medical procedure. Uh, so uh, this is together with uh, examples of, of horrible uh, interference with family life that the governments uh, conduct, uh, like uh, taking away children from their parents for some purposes. Like uh, in Poland, uh, not very long ago, we had a case of parents being deprived of their rights because they are not, uh, they cannot afford raising children, the court said. They have, they don't earn enough money to raise their raise their uh, children uh, properly so so uh, the police men <laughs> and women came and took uh, the babies to uh, uh, to some some place where the government will take care of them so uh, we are we are closer and closer to the situation uh, uh, in which the government is going to not only to sponsor something, but is uh, going probably to forbid uh, some of us to uh, to raise our uh, children, uh, as uh, it was demanded by some of the eugenicists in the 18th, in the 19th century, because they uh, they came up with the this this insane idea that uh, not everybody not everybody uh, should. Should uh, should be allowed to to have uh, children. Uh, so everything everything that we talk about is of course uh, this this one general uh, revolutionary war that is being fought fought against us right for for five centuries at least at least since Martin Luther started the war. It is, it, is, it is all the same. It is all the same. Uh, it has different colors. Red, 
uh, brown, green <laughs> color are being used for banners, uh, but it's it's always the same revolution. And uh, who are the enemies of this revolution? The enemies are are three natural environments that people are born into and live in. Families. Uh, that is families, that is uh, our church community, mm -hmm. and this is the number one, of course, mm -hmm. church. Church is the enemy number one of the revolutionaries. And third, nations. Nations. In the 19th century, there was, uh, they used the idea of a nation for their revolutionary purposes. That is, uh, uh, in mid-19th century, uh, there was this idea that every nation should uh, have uh, uh, its uh, state, right? Now they are telling us that it's over. It's over. It's long gone. Now we it's, don't need our, our it's states. It's had its purpose. Yeah, yeah. Because, because in, in Polish we say mądrość etapu, uh, uh, a wisdom of, uh, of certain stage, right? <laughs> there are no truths, absolute truths. More but relative. Yeah. Because everything is relative. Because everything, everything can, be, can be used... Uh, as, a, as a tool to obtain this final, uh, final uh, goal, which is destruction. Destruction of the family, of the nation, and of the church. Mm -hmm. And of course, it is who's fighting this war, who's the chief revolutionary. It is, it is uh, the chief enemy mm -hmm. of, of God himself, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Who's fighting this war, but his, uh, his problem is that he has to use us. Right, he has no other way to fight this war, but he has to use us. And uh, uh, I think my conclusion here uh, at this moment, uh, since everything, all these atrocities and all these horrible, these horrible things are possible because. Uh, mm, because we can debate values, right? We can debate and we can vote over values. Then I say that it is childish and uh, very naive to think that one can oppose this revolution sticking to, to the democratic way. <laughs> because democracy itself is the system that brought that brought these insanities into our world. But to, 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 just on that point, though, in Ireland, see democracy like our constitution, which help, helps us to, uh, we're, we're, you know, for instance, with abortion, we 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 have to have a referendum. Well, not necessarily, but in the past we've had to have referendums. While in England, it's through legislation. So. <coughs> I do hear what you're saying. The majority is not always right, obviously, but it does help to the have... The very idea you know, that one can, can vote mm -hmm. over human life, right, mm -hmm. is, 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 is horror to is it, me. Is it, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so mm -hmm. the very system mm -hmm. that invites us, well, to invite uh, the euthanasia uh, lobby mm -hmm. to, to, uh, together in, uh, in the, the European Parliament. At, at, and our, European, at our taxpayers. Yeah, mm. yeah, Expense, yeah. This is, yeah. This, is, this, is, this is what democracy is. Mm -hmm. This is not, not some, some uh, accidental fault, right? Some, some, some imperfection of uh, democracy. I say that it is not uh, imperfection, it is, it is, it is a rule. <laughs> well, I think, I, think I mean, from, from an Irish perspective and the change, the dramatic change that's happened here in the, sure, sure, I mean, 20 years, um, I think what our battle is, 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 is a spiritual battle that we have to regain the hearts and minds of people. I don't think it matters too much of the political system. I think if we can get back, if we can get back the, the hearts and minds of the people, if, if we can win um, with the Christian philosophy, um, which is, as Caddy mentioned, you know, oppose the dignity of the human person from the moment of conception. But it is, it is a matter of, 
I mean, you look at that there, that horrific picture there of the thousand babies frozen. Yeah. I mean, to somebody who hasn't got um, a Christian um, background, they will just see that for what it is. But we see a human person in that in that set in yeah. those cells, you know. Yeah. Um, and that and to me, that's a, a gift from God, a gift from God that we're given, a great great grace from God that we can actually see the beauty, the dignity of the human person in the just that what the pro-abortion lobby would call a clump of cells, you know. And the Catholic Church is and was always the only one mm -hmm. to stick to, to this mm -hmm. yeah. point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, please remember, uh, not very long ago it was uh, uh, that everybody all over the world, uh, the press, they were mocking uh, the Pope, John Paul II, then, uh, for uh, his uh, uh, strong and consequent opposition to the idea of using human embryos for uh, uh, designing some, uh, um, uh, uh, some cure mm -hmm. for uh, whatever it was. Parkinson's, yeah. I think. Yeah. 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 And, and not... And everybody was mocking the Pope and, and uh, calling uh, him names and us Catholics names. And not uh, many years passed and uh, scientists came uh, up uh, with uh, uh, other ways to design this uh, good yeah. treatment without uh, using human flesh. Right? So the Pope was right, <laughs> and yeah. the Church was right, uh, and uh, not, uh, not uh, popular opinion. And from, from this documentary that I haven't uh, uh, seen uh, for quite a long time, so I watched it uh, uh, together with you today with uh, some interest, <laughs> uh, I like uh, especially uh, one sentence uh, that uh, uh, this this uh, Polish name, uh, American scientist from Cold Spring Harbor, uh, says. Uh, he, uh, he's about to characterize uh, mm, uh, Mr. Laughlin, uh, this uh, mm, uh, uh, second to Davenport uh, mm, eugenicist in, uh, in Cold Spring Harbor, and uh, he He says, well, he was uh, a man of his time, mm. right? So, uh, so this has to be said, that we are not supposed to be men of our time, right? This is not, this is not any value to be a man of your time, mm. right? So, since, since it is so, uh, then uh, to... to um, uh, Mm, to think then that any goals can be uh, gained, that uh, that this revolution can be can be successfully opposed uh, with uh, preservation of peace, mm -hmm. this is this is naive. <coughs> there, there can be no peace with the revolutionaries, right? We are at war. We 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 are not. The, the ones who started the war. We are not the ones who, who like this war. I at least, you know, I, I have uh, thick glasses and I'm, I'm not a soldier. I, I don't like fighting, mm. but, but I feel that I am uh, uh, I'm being uh, seen by some people uh, as, as an enemy. As an enemy, so it is, it is very... Mm, uh, it would not be reasonable to uh, to try to um, because they are shooting at us right they are shooting by by papers by television by by legislature <laughs> they are shooting so uh, 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 since we not always can uh, can uh, um, can recognize the shooters right <laughs> we don't know who's who's behind them uh, behind by, behind the journalists uh, but but we have to be aware that a war is on, right? And uh, once again, <laughs> I'll say that, that uh, democracy is not, not a solution to, to any of, of this. Democracy is, is the way, is, is the path that leads to this hell. 
we have we have a great signs of hope, thank God. I mean, you look at what's happened in Guatemala in the last number of years, where they reversed, and now they have pro-life laws. And is it is a South or North Dakota? North Dakota. North Dakota. There recently passing the law um, for for personhood. Um, we have in Ireland just the other day on Friday, our doctors, our biggest doctors' union, voted down um, three motions calling for abortion, and one of them in in one of the would be similar to eugenics in relation to poor children who are born with um, life-threatening illnesses, you know, won't, won't survive much um, after birth. You know, they voted all these yeah. down. So there's great signs of hope. There's great signs of hope. And, you know, it's, um, you know, I know I know it can seem like it's it's that there's, you know, there, it is it is a battle, absolutely, but it's uh, a battle, again, for the hearts and minds of people, which can be won through prayer, and and true, giving them giving people the truth. The truth is, I mean, the, the Dominican motto is veritas, and um, Jesus Christ is the truth. And I, well, I, would, would people hear the truth? With this, I don't argue. You of know, course, yeah, yeah. Yeah. everything can be gained by by yeah, prayer. Yeah. I, I believe that. Yeah. I believe yeah. that. Yeah. May I say something? Yeah. Thank you. It was most interesting. Sorry. My name is Brida Murphy. It's most interesting what I saw here tonight. I had an idea of some of it. But you talk about eugenics. This is going on every day. It's in our skies. In Ireland, it's in our water. And it's the GM foods. Hmm. Now, with the geoengineering, people are becoming very ill. And there are two types of illness. One is what I call the chemtrail cough. There is a bizarre increase of people suffering from respiratory problems. Mm. I won't go into full details if people want to look up this, but they're called the, the Great Culling. And they're part of our air, our water, and our GM foods. Our foods. Because if you don't have nutrition, from your food, you cannot survive. And in Ireland, they have been putting this stuff in our water since the 60s. And now they want us to pay while they're poisoning us for this. And in Ireland, it's only Ireland that has it, and part of the Basque country that has this fluoride. And there's another sort of thing, I'm not good, I'm not a scientist, but I have intelligence to know that what they're taking out of a mine in China, this is in our water. And I know I almost died from this geoengineering three years ago. And I actually chained myself to what I thought was the door, is Leinster House. I'm, and I have no fear, but I will fight till my breath gives out for other people that I love and care about. And people need to be aware. You can talk about, I am aware of abortion and eugenics, but they are doing it to us every day. And I'm fed up of people saying, oh, what are we going to do with our taxpayers' money with people with disability? And I keep trying to change this mindset. Because this, we are paying for it to be poisoned on a daily basis. I got in filtered water three years ago and I tried to take that with me wherever I go and I don't buy Irish anymore because it's in, it's in our cheese, everything. And you need to be aware. Also, can I make one more for, further comment? For the last 25 years or to 30 years, they've been taking this heel prick from the babies born. This is the DNA, and now this talks about them destroying it. But why have they taken the Irish DNA? I haven't heard of any other countries' DNA being taken. And why have they put this water in our water since the 60s? This is, has my bones, but I was so angry they were not going to get my lungs. And I actually spoke to uh, Professor Connor Burke, and he's written four papers on geoengineering about two years ago. And I continue to do research in this subject because people need to be, connect 
what the year they're breeding and the illness they're experiencing. At Christmas, just before Christmas, people in my area were very ill. One was what I call a can drill drop, which affects your thing. Myself, I was confined to the house. I had to get the emergency doctors. And if I hadn't gone to a, a note to NATO conference just after the second Lisbon Treaty, I would not have known what chemtrails were. At that time, when I came back, it was just over, over just three cities. It's now everywhere. It is not just pollution. People think it's pollution. It's not. You can wake up in the morning, the sky is blue. And if you look, over the day, as it progresses, the sky starts to darken. And what I call now, it covers over. It's a whiteout. And what I was sprayed with was a NATO helicopter. Because I live near the Kerr, where there's an army base. We're not neutral. And, these, we're part, and you probably know this from being in the European Parliament. This, and everybody thinks the UN is fantastic. The UN was founded by Rockefeller. NATO is a private company. And who's the head of NATO in this country? I saw it in writing, Enda Kenny. There was a summit in Chicago this year, or last year. He was at that. Noonan was at a meeting with the Bilderbergs <coughs> in um, Virginia. And people here never heard of them, but I was aware of them. But this knowledge needs to get out. And, I, and it took 10 years for what was happening at Shannon to come out. I feel we do not have 10 years, because it's happening in Poland, it's happening all over the world. Most of us call it chemtrailing. A manual came out, maybe I'm not correct in the dates, but the US military were trained in the use of these chemtrails. And that has been taken, I, I go on Facebook, mainly for information. And I find out other things. And a question has, questions have been asked. Someone put up uh, something about what I'm talking about, the subject I'm talking about, and that was pulled. And any time I tried to maybe write up something about the Constitution here, my c computer crashes, and I can't post it. But our, com our, our Constitution has been weakened. It is not the first Constitution that Michael Collins and those people envisioned. <coughs> it has been weakened, but it doesn't stop you from buying a copy. It's not easy, it's not that hard to understand. And I would advise everybody to get themselves a copy. Because we are a sovereign nation, and this is where they have problems with us in the EU. And this is where they have problems with, with us as regards the, the rights of the child. And the language they use. Why wouldn't you vote good? Because it's the good of the children. I was watching a video there by UK Column. It's in the world, One World uh, Chronicles at the moment. It's absolutely appalling. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure whether I need the, the microphone or not, but uh, I'm not just anyway. Uh, just, I'm, I'm a member of the School of History in. UCC, so much of what I've heard as I'm listening with, with the ear of a historian, uh, not necessarily somebody who's completely au fait with contemporary developments, and much of what Cathy had to say was, was very, very interesting. Uh, I just want to say, make a few points. I don't want to, to go on too long, uh, because I know that the, the other people want to, to say a couple of things. Just, just one thing on, on the, the democracy side. Uh, there are two principles in, in Catholic teaching, which, as it were, help to <laughs> take off the hard edge of democracy and let nobody forget that Hitler came to power democratically. Yeah. First is, and one of which is absolutely Polish in its conception. The first, which is a long-standing one, is the principle of subsidiarity. That mm -hmm. is the, the, the maximum devolution of power, uh, i.e. a weak state. Uh, states are there for a purpose, they can do good. Excessive power, as with it, all things, is, is, is a bad thing. The other principle, which is, thank God for the polls of 30 years ago, is solidarity, solidarity, that helps, as it were, to the, 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 the centripetal force of subsidiarity. Solidarity helps to, to keep those together. 
So those two philosophical principles, if they're observed, and much of the strength of the 1937 constitution arose from the fact that those two principles were embodied without necessarily them being used in that terminology. And much of the weakness of the, the 37 constitution, the, the weakening of the 37 constitution has taken place, has been as a result of the neglect of those two, two principles. Um, a personal experience. Uh, there was a reference made to the fact that there are almost no Down syndrome babies born in what is politely called the developed world. It's not just in, in Britain or America. My, a, a very close uh, 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 female member of my family, uh, about 15 years ago, uh, went to hospital. She was pregnant and for her first checkup, and the, uh, the scan showed, as far as the doctor was concerned, an abnormality. And she was then put under incredible pressure Mm. to have an abortion. This wasn't a mm. question of some sort of freedom of choice yeah. that you have an option. Yeah. It was coercion. Yeah. And if, were it not for the fact that she was an incredibly strong person, and this of course are a moment in any woman's life, probably the, the, the worst possible moment in any woman's life, to, to, to hear that mm. your, 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 your child uh, may not be perfect. None of us are, of course. She resisted. Uh, the baby was born without any abnormality, not that that would have made a blind bit of difference yeah. to its humanity, um, but it's, it's a, a clay, absolutely classic case study of, as it were, the alignment between state power in the velvet glove of welfareism, mm -hmm. uh, and welfareism can do many good things, but it is also a soft form of totalitarianism. It is the, uh, the, the state reaches into every aspect of... Uh, of citizens' lives, and the ideology of a, a form of ideology of women's rights. Of course, there are many different ideologies of women's rights, but there is a particular the narrow one, as, as far as I'm concerned, which helped justify uh, that idea. Uh, one, one point of just this, as it were, as a, as a historian, uh, the, the debate about abortion, and notwithstanding the IMO's decision to reject all forms of abortion, the government has pledged itself to continue with its legislation. Just to cast our minds back to why it was necessary to introduce a constitutional provision against abortion in 1983. There's a lot of revisionism going on at the moment about why that amendment took place. <coughs> and the argument is that sort of a group of hardline doctrinaire Catholics inspired by the visit of Pope John Paul to Ireland in 1979 decided to insert a provision that would, as it were, coerce the rest of the population. Uh, into thinking the way that they did. It's exactly the opposite. Two judicial decisions uh, in the 1970s made necessary that, that amendment. The first was the Roe versus Wade decision in the, Supreme, in the American Supreme Court in the early 1970s, which indicated that judges were prepared to simply cast aside all notions of tradition, doctrine, and indeed democracy, uh, I deciding that this wasn't a matter for the people to decide, I, but for judges to ha hand down from on high. And secondly, what well, was in some respects a, a, a comparable decision in the Irish Supreme Court in the McGee case in, in with regard to contraception that read contraception as, a, as it were as a form of human rights. In, so that indicated that the Irish Supreme Court was at every bit as willing as the American Supreme Court as it were, to use this doctrine of human rights to impose from above, from the top down, a certain view of humanity and human relations, etc., etc. That was the origin of the original 1983 constitutional amendment, i.e. that it could only be done through the people. That if, if that decision was to be overturned, it was not going to be done through the courts. And of course, remember now that in the American Supreme Court, the, the case of gay marriage is following exactly the same line as the, the Roe versus Wade decision, i.e. doing it through the courts, not through democracy. Courts, of course, systems apply in any type of uh, political system. Um, and for that reason, anybody who hears the discussion about the 1983 amendment and how what an awful idea it was, just remember what the alternative is, which is to hand over power over incredibly important decisions with regard to each one of us to a tiny unelected number of, of, of judges who, who may use that power very well, who may use that power very, very badly. We've seen in a recent case with regard to surrogacy, uh, the, the separation of biological motherhood uh, from birth. Uh, I don't, uh, so there are so many points here that I, I, I don't want to 
moment until I go into Tuesday, there's one tiny little point with regard to one of the things that was inferred.